Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to B-Sides Las Vegas. This is the Breaking Ground track. Uh, the talk today is going to be, uh, our next talk is All You Need Is Guest, Beyond Enumeration, by Michael Bargery. Uh, before we get started, a couple quick announcements. We would like to thank our sponsors, especially our diamond sponsor, Adobe, and some of our gold sponsors, PrismaCloud, SemGrep, and Toyota. It's their support, along with our other sponsors, donors, and volunteers that make this event possible. These talks are going to be streamed live, and as a courtesy to our speakers, we're gonna ask that you please make sure that your cell phones are on silent. Without further ado, Michael Bargery. Okay, um, does, it work? does this work? Can you hear me? All right. So, uh, first of all, thank you for staying with me. I know it's kind of late in the day. And because this is, uh, I mean, it's late in the day for all of us, so I think we can make it like a more, more chill kind of talk. So if you have questions, if you have comments, if you want to say that I'm wrong somewhere, just, just shout out during the talk. Okay, don't, don't wait for the end. Um, what we're going to, bef you know, before I explain anything, let me do a quick slide-based demo, okay? So, um, Say you have access to uh, an Azure Active Directory guest account. We've all, got, we've all received these, uh, these emails where you get invited to somebody else's tenant. Uh, and that's, uh, so you could, it could happen because you work with them, you're a contractor or something. Well, all right. Um, when you actually log in to, to this guest account and you go to their tenant, by default, by default you will you'll actually find nothing there because guests don't have access to anything uh, unless, unless the, somebody actively gives them the access, right? Uh, and so uh, what we're gonna show today is, this is that this is definitely not true. The tool that I'm going to release in this talk is going to produce for you with a guest account, uh, SQL servers, Azure resources. I'm not talking about enumeration here. I'm talking about full dumps of all of the data behind all of these resources. This is a true example. You'll understand what's going on here uh, at the end of this talk. And so now that I hopefully, uh, and yeah, there's also a dump. Uh, and so now that I hopefully have your attention, um, hi, my name is Michael. I am focused on security for low-code, no-code apps, which is the kind of applications that business users are building. Uh, I've been doing that for about four years now. There was a bunch of research uh, I put out there. So if, if you're interested about, uh, on this topic, uh, please reach out afterwards. And uh, I'm, we're looking for more smart people to kind of focus on this area. So uh, reach out to me. All right. So. Before we understand kind of what's, what's, uh, what's going on here, we need to spend a brief moment understanding what guests are, what is this mechanism actually is. Uh, so if you, well, the, the scenario is that, well, you wanna, you wanna be able to share with someone. Uh, my, I, I work for a small company, like a 20, 25 people startup, and we work with very large enterprises. And so in most of the, time, most of the cases, we need to f find a way to, sh to collaborate on files, right? You need to share decks, you need to share uh, uh, legal, legal uh, docs. And so there are multiple ways in which you can share those, those uh, docs around. One thing you can do, um, which is pretty obvious, uh, you can just share those files over email, right? Uh, it's kind of funny, but we've all done that. And so this is one, one thing that you can absolutely do. You can, always, you can also just uh, trust a random website on the internet, which is also something that we've all, uh, that we've all done. I've uh, found out that you can also do this in real life. So there are USB ports all around the world. You can just plug in your computer and uh, drop whatever you'd like. So you can do that as well. Um, that's, a, that's, that's a real thing. Um, check out the website, it's really cool. So what you can also do is you can invite those guests into your tenant. And that's actually what Azure AD Guests is, is, is all about. Basically, the idea is that you bring people into your tenant, and then uh, two things happen. One is that they can bring their own identities, which means you don't have to worry about how they authenticate. And two, you are still in control. 
And th those are two significant promises to try and hold together. So let's try and figure out what exactly does that mean. In order for this mechanism to actually work, two things need to be, uh, need to hold. One is that this needs to be very easy to onboard. Every vendor, every contractor, they use a different thing. They need to be able to get on your, uh, your tenant quickly. And the second thing, it, it of course needs to be easy to control, right? Because otherwise you, you've just invited a guest into your tenant. I mean, what could happen? Um, and so let's try and figure out these two things. So the first thing, Can you try to bring your mic a bit higher up? Yeah. Does that help? In any way? All right. So the, the first thing I need to prove to you is that, like, getting a guest account is very easy. And while I talk, you can see that I'm inviting myself to a guest with a bunch of different ways to do that through uh, Microsoft. Notice that all of these options to invite guests are embedded into productivity apps. So you own a Teams channel or you own a SharePoint site. You just uh, want to collaborate with someone, so you plug in their email and it invites them as a guest. This is a decision that a business user makes, not a decision that an admin makes. Right? And so this is very easy to achieve. And actually, when you look at the AAD tenant for any large enterprise, most of them, you'll find lots of guests. You can go down the very strict route of kind of cutting this and, and, and not using this feature. But then, well, how do you share files? We've, we've, we've seen the other options. Um, and so it's very easy to, share get, to get guests. In some, in some cases, it might even be too easy. So again, um, this is, this is the email that you receive as a guest. Actually, uh, in, a talk, in a talk last year, Dirk Jan showed that you can hijack guest accounts. A talk at Black Hat last year, he showed that you can hijack guest accounts, guest invites that were not redeemed, and then redeem them yourself with any email address that you'd like. This was actually fixed, but this, is a, kind of a, this was a, a, a pretty cool thing because any user in the organization could just query open, uh, open tickets and then just grab them. And so it's very easy to get to guess guests. I, I think that's kind of pretty, pretty established. The second thing that I need to prove to you is that it's uh, still easy to control. It's easy for IT and security to control. And so let's see that part. And so in order to do that, we need to understand how does Azure Active Directory guest actually work. And so on the vendor side, partner side, you could be using any, any, any type of identity provider. You could be using another AAD account, but you can, just, you can use a Google Suite or Okta or whatever you'd like. And so the way that it works is that it creates a link between those two directories. And so you get authenticated with your home tenant, and your guest tenant just trusts that authentication. Um, and the, the cool thing about it is that because it's done this way, all of the security controls that Microsoft provides for you apply. So if you have uh, conditional access, MFA enforced, whatever you'd like, this all uh, get enforced automatically on guests, which is awesome, right? This is a, a really cool mechanism. Um, and so one thing that we need to understand, though, is that, well, in order to give somebody uh, guest access, we, we want uh, security controls, right? Because otherwise, you'll, you've just invited somebody into your tenant and they can do whatever they like. In order to get security controls, we need to have an AAD account because otherwise we can't apply the security mechanisms that we already have as an enterprise. And so in order to have that account, we need to grant access to AAD, which actually grants full access to your tenant. So what's, what's actually happening here? Um, so the crucial piece is that you don't get full access. You get access that's denied by default. You get access that gives you access to no nothing, basically. So if I invited you through Teams, you'll only, you'll only get access to that specific team uh, channel, or at least that's what, it should, uh, that's what should happen. So a quick recap here. Guests are, first of all, very, very, very easy to guest. We should, we should assume that a compromise in a guest account within our tenant is, is easy. Uh, AAD controls apply, uh, security controls apply, which is great, and access should be denied by default. And now when I've talked uh, so much good things about this mechanism, uh, let's see what happens in practice. Uh, because in practice, as we know, things are a bit, a bit more, a bit dirtier. And so, um, first of all, there are, so okay, so let's start by kind of just inviting some, a, a guest around. And every time you see this icon on the uh, bottom right corner, 
that's kind of the the uh, the user, the legitimate user that's that's doing something, and you'll see in a, in a moment an icon, a different icon for for a hacker, just because I'm gonna move between users a lot, um, and so I'm, I'm in Teams. I'm going to kind of just uh, invite somebody. I'm going to invite a hacker in because why not? Uh, that's my hacker account here. And then uh, once I invite that inv uh, that that guest, I click on that, and and that guest is invited, and they will get the, that email that we that we saw earlier. From the hacker perspective, and uh, you can see the hacker uh, icon here, um, I'm, I'm just I just log into my account, and then I need to allow this tenant to get access, uh, kind of, uh, to basic information about my profile, and I'll do that. A Zenity demo is kind of the the the, the thing that I'm hacking, uh, and again I, I get to this to this uh, portal which is empty because it's showing me all of the apps that I have access to, which is actually none. Okay, um, and so there's there are two things that we already know how to do, and if you've Googled it before, you would have found it before this talk. One is phishing through Teams. Once you get invited to, uh, into, into a guest, into a tenant as a guest, then you can do phishing through the in internal teams uh, of, of that organization, which is actually pretty nice because it, it adds some uh, believability into to your phishing attempt. The other thing that you can do is, is recon on, on the directory, so you can actually find, there's some sophisticated ways in which you can find a list of users within the, within that organization, even though you are not uh, allowed to directly enumerate the users. Uh, if you if you want uh, to look at it, there's a there's a nice link there that it will it will share everything about it. Um, and so this is the state of the art for guest exploitation. But of course, we want more, right? We want access to resources. And so this is the point in the talk where um, I'm basically suggesting that if you don't want to have a responsibility when you go back uh, to work, then, then this is the time to leave. Because right now I'm going to show uh, how this is completely, uh, how, how the reality differs from, from uh, your expectations. Any takers? <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to do right now is just uh, virtually click on that link. So when I click on that link, I get invited to something. I, I get into something called Power Apps, uh, which is the local local platform for uh, for Microsoft, which is built into Office. Uh, and the first thing that you'll see here is that uh, well, I get I get some sort of an error, uh, which is telling me basically you're trying to reach an environment which does not belong to your tenant. This is because the link that I've uh, set earlier is is in the in the guest tenant, right? Not my home tenant, and so I click on this go to home page, and I get to my home page, and now I'm in power in power apps. But you can see here that I'm in my own tenant, Pontoso, which is the the hacker's uh, tenant, and so now I need to to be able to switch to the guest tenant. Um, that's pretty easy. You just kind of you go to switch directory, and now I'm I'm in I'm in the right. I'm gonna move to the right tenant, right? So you can move to any any one of the tenants that that you have access to. Again. Uh, when you get access as a guest to somebody else's corporate, this is just waiting for you, all right? And so once you do that, then you get to where I actually sent you with this link, which is a screen called uh, Connections. And you can see that these connections have uh, Azure connections, connections uh, for SQL servers. You can see their names. Um, and for some reason, as a guest, I'm able to see all of them. And so let's try and figure out um, what the hell is this? <laughs> Why does this exist, and uh, and why do we have access into it? And so let's examine one of them. This is a Azure file storage, and it uh, it's called something like uh, uh, Jamie Redding Customer Data. All right. So first of all, you can see this little menu here. Two interesting things. So one is uh, details. Well, we'll 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 see that in a moment. But the other is share. So there's a share button here on a connection to Azure file storage. Let's look at that share button. All right, so this uh, uh, file storage connection is apparently shared with three different entities. The first thing is shared with org. The second thing is shared with, with Jamie. This is probably the Jamie that created this connection. And the third thing here is Jamie, uh, and you can almost barely see that uh, th this is a, a, an Outlook account, a personal account. And you can see the different permissions that each of them have. And so this is the root cause issue of why we're seeing this connection right now. Okay, so Jamie has, has created this connection and has shared this with everyone. And uh, actually what's going on here is that this 
connection is a wrapper around credentials. It can be an OAuth token, a refresh token, or so Jamie's own refresh token, her own identity, or it could be like a username password or a client secret or whatever you'd like. And then you can just take this wrapper and share it with everyone. Everyone means your entire AAD guest, uh, your, your entire AAD tenant. You can also share this with uh, groups, with spe specific individuals, with your own Outlook account, whatever. Just, just kind of be productive. Um, and so this, this works and this kind of, this is pretty cool. Let's try and figure out what this connection actually is. Why, why does this exist? And so going back to details, and now I can see a bunch of information about this connection. I can see that it, indeed it was created, it is owned by Jamie Redding. And trying to figure out who Jamie is, uh, I can see that Jamie is a customer service representative that works in, in sales ops. So Jamie is a business user. So Jamie made, made the decision, which was a bad decision, to share this uh, connection around. And we'll see in a moment that this is, uh, this is a common mistake to make because it, the, the platform just make it very easy for you to, to actually do it. Um, and so before we move forward with this talk, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with low-code, no-code. And so I need to explain to you why is this happening. Why, does, why, why is it believable that somebody from the business would create a connection to Azure and share it with the entire org? So here's the reason. Yeah, okay. So you won't get the, the video, but here's the reason. Basically, um, low-code, no-code is, is putting power in the hands of business users to build their own applications and automations on top of business data. What this uh, video actually shows is that not, right now they've integrated the ChatGPT into, into their platform. So you can just uh, kind of ask them, ask ChatGPT to create an app for you, and it would create a table on a database and share it with everyone and create the different, and create the columns and create the, the actual app. And so this is something that business users are actually using to solve their own business problems. And when they do it, they do it on, on, on business data, of course. And so as a business user, you mostly don't have access to service accounts, right? You do have access to your own credentials. So why not wrap them around with a thing called connections and share them, share your refresh tokens with uh, whoever wants it. Um, and so this is the way that this typically works. And one of the things that is important for you to understand that this is a big issue is just understand the scale of this thing. And so here's what I did here. Um, Okay, this is a slide showing um, right now a single number, uh, 5 million. That's the number of, uh, of developers using .NET today according to Microsoft, all right? Um, a pretty big number. How many developers do you think are using this, uh, like business developers, are using this local no-code tool in order to build their own applications? Just have a number in your head, something that, that fits with your model of the world where if you look at uh, where we focus most of our attention, it's on uh, applications that those people are building, right? Uh, people that are building it with code. And so I, I actually went through Microsoft earning, earning reports for the, kind of, for the few uh, uh, years uh, back and they mentioned the numbers here and there. So here are the, here are the numbers from the, from, the, from the reports according to the uh, small uh, kind of li linear regression I did here, there are about 8 million developers today. And so I'm sure that most of the people in this room have either never heard of this before or didn't dedicate a lot of their career to try and solve this problem. Uh, this is actually kind of becoming huge, huge within the top organizations in the world. And so we need to start dedicating our time here. Um, and so now that we understand that this thing is happening, it is happening in every major org, really, every major org out, out there, because just show me a, 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 an ent a large enterprise that's not a Microsoft shop, let's uh, figure out how do we get from those connections to actually doing something with them. Um, and so in this, in this part right now, I'm just gonna take you through the rabbit hole of how do we get to this. So we, we were able to see these connections, that's fine, but now, we want to automate things, we want to dump, dump the data behind this. We want to make this into something that we can use as hackers. And so let's try to figure out how that works. Just before we, uh, okay, uh, 
Paul, just, just before we get uh, into the next phase here, uh, we do a thing called outrageous speaker requests here at B-Sides every year. Uh, when someone submits a talk, they, there's a field right at the very end that says any outrageous requests, and a lot of times they throw something in there at two in the morning and forget about it. Uh, the request that we have from you was to help you find more hacker friends, I think is the, the actual thing. So first off, I wanna make sure, uh, is this you? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna ask everybody in the audience, if you, if you can, uh, if you are on Twitter, uh, and this one's you as well? Yep. Okay. So I, I'm going to at MBRG0, and I'm going to follow him, and I'm going to go to uh, LinkedIn, uh, where uh, we have, and I'm sorry, how do you pronounce your last name? Bargari? Bargari. Bargari, okay. Yeah. Uh, Michael Bargari, and I'm going to add him, and I encourage everyone here, pull out your phones, and do the same thing right now. Help me, help yes. me fill this outrageous speaker request. Cheers. <laughs> Have a good day. Thank you. Actually, there are so many avenues for research here, and we are so little, they're so, the group of people that is focused on this area is so small. If you're interested in like a, an interesting challenge and just banging your heads against the wall with this, just reach out to me, there are plenty of things we can, we can collaborate on. All right. So now uh, let's do some hacking. Uh, first of all, I wanna, and again, I'm, I'm authenticated as, as a guest here and I'm looking at, at the specific connection. Let's try to figure out what information lies behind this Azure file storage thing. And so I'm going through the, there's a tab here called applications that use this connection. And so let's just try to uh, log, log into that application, customer insight something, all right. Uh, this takes me to a page which g gives me some information about this app and then there's this link. And by the way, you'll notice that this link is a Microsoft link inside of the Microsoft own domain. And in DEF CON last year, what I showed was that you can create a phishing app that would be hosted by Microsoft in this, in this link and supports SSO and everything is uh, kind of nice and believable. So uh, check that out if you're interested. Um, and so when I click on this app, I get this kind of thing that's stopping me, that's not allowing me to actually view this app. And if you look, um, I'll kind of I'll open this up, and if you look closely, this is telling me uh, that I don't have a license. And so this, this makes sense, right? Uh, I, I'm a guest, I don't have a, uh, by, de by default, I don't, I'm not supposed to be able to do anything. And so the clue to, to understand how do we circumvent this is the sentence uh, above here, so I'll read it out. You don't have the correct plan to access this app, ask your admin for one, or ask the admin at, your, at the organization in which you're a guest. Can you guess what I'm, what I'm gonna do to bypass this? So I need a license. I don't have a license in the guest tenant. What would happen if I have a, a license in my own tenant? Nah, that, that, that shouldn't work, right? Okay, let's try. Uh, here's um, like a developer plan I can get for free but for Microsoft. Um, I'll just uh, say, hey, can I get a license for this hacker account? Uh, and they'll say, yeah, of course, uh, here's a license. Uh, and now, of course, I'm in, because why not? If you have a license in one tenant, then it applies to another tenant. Uh, that's great. And now, after this thing loads, uh, then I get to this screen, which is telling me something very weird, uh, that this app is not compliant with the latest data prevention policies. All right. Uh, and you can see here something about uh, a policy name, deny Azure file storage. DLP inside of this power apps thing, inside of this low code thing, that's kind of weird. Um, and so, let's try and, so I, I was able to circumvent the license issue, but now I'm blocked by a DLP. And so, Microsoft has actually integrated something they call uh, DLP, data loss policies, inside, uh, inside of this uh, uh, power up thing, inside of this local no-go thing, which is great, right? We have business users that are building applications. We are worried about data moving out of our tenant. Uh, let's have a DLP built in. This is a great idea. So let's use this great idea. Again, I'm logged in as the, as the, uh, as the user that's kind of the trusted user, the user that's fine. And I'm going to create a, a DLP policy to find social security numbers within my tenant. Uh, it's going to be awesome. I'm going to choose... Um, connectors, all right, so I need to choose a connector. I'm gonna choose the SharePoint connector, something about it not being blockable. Um, uh, I'm kinda stuck, I'm not, not really sure, I'm not sure if, if you 
kind of what would you do next in this screen? Like, uh, how, uh, how, how do you move forward with applying this DLP policy? So, actually, the thing here is that um, this is not DLP. This is not DLP in the sense that you think about DLP. This is a, an allow list, deny list for connectors. Connectors mean connector to SharePoint, like SharePoint as a whole. Everybody's SharePoint, every site, every tenant, whatever you'd like. Every OneDrive for business. Some connectors are not blockable at all, so you cannot block uh, SharePoint. But you can block, uh, I don't know, SQL Server, for example. This is definitely not DLP in the sense that we think about as security people. So it needs to be kind of clear here. And the second thing that's interesting is that this DLP is actually full of holes, and one of my uh, hobbies is to try and figure out uh, all of the different holes uh, within this DLP. Currently, I, I, I know of five. And so uh, here are, here's, kind of, here's one of them, and another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. These are all just ways in which you, you create a sophisticated DLP policy that bypass, bypasses itself. This is all uh, com completely public. Uh, admittedly, there are some advanced features in this DLP policy. You can do kind of endpoint filtering, but it also only works in, uh, uh, in compile mode rather than runtime. So not a security, not a security mechanism. This, would, this might prevent users from making mistakes. This would definitely not prevent a hacker from doing something within your org. But having said all of that, I mean, we are still blocked, right? We are still blocked by this thing right now, uh, and we need to circumvent that. And um, I'm going to be honest with you, uh, I, I, I have a way to, <laughs> I have a way forward, but unfortunately, I won't be able to actually share uh, that, that, bit, that bit right now because uh, Microsoft asked me not to. Uh, and so they're going <laughs> to they're gonna, they're gonna fix it, uh, which is great. And so after they fix it, I'm going to put the information there in the link. Uh, but until then, let's just kind of, <laughs> let's forget about it. Um, all right. So forgetting about it, uh, I cannot. I, I was not able to um, to actually get something from Azure File Storage. Let's just take another connection here. Here's a SQL storage uh, called Enterprise Customers. Sounds nice. So again, go into details. Applications using these connections. I see a bunch of applications. Uh, I click on one of those applications, and this time I actually got into the app. And the first thing that I see when I go into the app is this screen that is telling me, "Hey, I'm going to use." this SQL connection in this app. By the way, again, think about like regular applications. You tend to see like an OAuth consent form, something like that. This is not it. This is, I'm going to use this connection which somebody else has, uh, has already shared with you, and I'm going to use it in this app. And it's not limited by permissions, because it's whatever you gave the, uh, the token initially. All right, so I'm going to go to this app, and now I can actually finally see data. This is the SQL Server data behind this connection that this app is actually fetching. So you can see information about uh, customers, right? This is just like a, a list of users. And then for each one of those users, I can click on a user, and I can see information about that user, including social security number. Of course, this is all generated by, Ch by ChatGPT, so uh, thank you OpenAI for that. Um, and now. We want to understand how we can kind of fetch this data in a more, uh, I don't know, robust way. And so just looking at the requests that, that this thing is actually sending, you can see that all of this information is being fetched uh, through this request. And looking at, the, at, at that request, I can see two things. So one, I'm not sure if that's going to work. So right here, I'm going to something called Azure APIM. We'll see that in a moment. And here, inside of this request URL, you can see this long URL, which has something with the enterprise customers table. Uh, all right, we'll, we'll try to figure out, figure out what that means in, in, in a moment. Uh, but just to show you that, yeah, all right. Um, so again, what I'm going to do is just copy this, this uh, uh, request. And then just replay it, and I get all of the all of the information, right? And so this is just what the app is doing. This is not the entire uh, data behind behind this uh, SQL Server. So let's try and figure out what's actually going on here. This is uh, Power App is actually using this endpoint Azure AP, APM.NET to fetch the uh, uh, information behind that connection. Actually, any any. Uh, operation that this app would like to do with this connection, it will do through this Azure APIM instance. Okay, so let's let's try to figure out this URL. It starts with Azure AP APM. That's just an Azure uh, API gateway. 
uh, that's hosted in Azure. Um, and all right, after that, it goes to SQL, and then an ID for, for this specific connection. If you use the same thing in your Power Apps instance, then you'll get the same URL, but just an, a different uh, ID. Uh, you'll probably not be in Europe, but well. Uh, and then after the SQL I get, I, um, I, I need to choose, choose the data set. This is because if you authenticate to SQL with your OAuth token, then you have actually access to multiple SQL, uh, SQL servers because this is uh, using your own kind of Azure managed identity. Um, and so you can see that I'm choosing the customer insights database uh, and the specific enterprise customer's data, uh, database, so a, a, a server and a database. And then uh, there's a request here to tables, and let me just fix the URL here. So tables, the name of the table, items. All right. So this is actually just an interface to query the SQL Server. Um, and so let's back up for a moment, and now I need to tell you what the hell is, is, is this thing. Um, the way that Power Apps work, but actually uh, this, is, this is kind of Microsoft focused, but all local, local, most local local platforms work this way because they need to be able to impersonate business users because business users need to be able to create apps with their own credentials. And so here's how it works. On the left side, you have the app. And on the right side, you have the API that it would like to call. And now there's, uh, there's this Azure API management thing that uh, the app will go up to Azure API. The app, the app doesn't have your credentials. It, it has the ID for that app. And then it goes out out to Azure API management, and it says, hey, I'm this app. Please uh, provide me access to, to that specific request through, uh, uh, through that API. And I'll note that as a user, you can share your credentials with other users. You can also share your credentials with an app, right, or an automation that runs on the, back, on the background without, without you actually being there. All right, so what actually happens here is that they have built a token storage that is uh, managed inside of this Azure API management instance, and the tokens get injected every time you, uh, you, you reach out with a request, and then they clean the, them out on, on the way back. All right? So this is how it works, and it works like that in, uh, with, with, most, with most of the platforms. And so let's try and take a look. Uh, uh, and so again, this, this, this thing is going to allow us, we've seen, I mean, we've seen one request. But this thing is going to allow us much more than that. So what we have up until now is the ability to, well, we, we went to the UI, we copied the, the request, now we can replay that request, that's fine. But can we actually generate the request without going through the manual processes? Can we automate this entire thing? In order to do that, um, we need to be able to make this request. In order to make this request, we need the token. So just let's figure out what this token actually grants us. So opening out the JWT token shows that I'm, uh, I get an audience of uh, API Hub, Azure.com. This is actually an internal thing Microsoft created on top of API management that does this entire uh, like uh, token exchange thing. And so what I need is a token with, a, uh, with the right permissions to, to query this API. Um, and the question, uh, and that's, that's the next question we, we need to answer. And so in order to do that, First, remember that I can generate tokens, right? This is my user. It's not, that's, not, that's not the problem. I need to generate the token with the right resource, with the right client that it would actually allow me to fetch information from this internal API. And so uh, I'm going to use this snippet, which is just like using a common Python libraries to, to generate this token. And now I just need to find the right client that it would allow me to get this resource. If I try to use a built-in client app, a, a public client app, again, this needs to be in the, in the guest tenant, right? So I cannot just create an app there. So if I, if I try to use a public client app, uh, it doesn't work because that app needs to be pre-consented to, uh, to have permissions to that resource. Um, if I try to use my own app in the, in the home tenant and make it a, a multi-tenant app, then it also doesn't work because I can't even ask for that permission. So if you'll go to the app and you'll try to ask for the right API permissions to query API Hub, you won't find it there because it's an internal API. Right? They, they, didn't, they didn't expose it to everybody. And so we're kind of stuck. Uh, we, are able to, we were able to, uh, to copy and then replay that request through the browser, but that's, that means we can do manual things. That's fine. That's not like a... 
uh, wide scale uh, ex uh, exfiltration thing. And so let's try and figure out how do we get to that token. And before that, I'm going to do a very quick recap. So we get access to an account, which is outside of, the, outside of our corporate. Uh, we, get, we get a guest account. We find a bunch of credentials on this thing called Power Apps, which business users are building, and then sharing those connections with everybody. We try to get access. We were blocked by license, so we just got a license. We were blocked by DLP, and then I uh, did a bunch of hand waving and we'll move forward. And uh, we were blocked by, uh, programmatic, by being able to progr get programmatic access to API Hub, and that's the last thing that's stopping us from getting access to those credentials. And so we need an AID app that is able to do a few things. One, it needs to be on by default because this needs to be already available in the guest tenant, which I cannot change. It needs to be pre-approved to query this API Hub thing. And it needs to be a public client because I need to be able to generate tokens. If it's a confidential client that I need a, uh, a certificate in order to generate uh, tokens, that then, then I won't have that certificate. And so let's try to get that. Um, we already know of one app that is able to generate those tokens, and that's, of course, Power Apps Portal, right? Because that's, that's where we found this token. Uh, but the, uh, and so this is on by default. Every tenant would have Power Apps. Uh, it's pre-approved to query API Hub. But unfortunately, it's, a, it's not a public client application. They've done their job well here. So it's a confidential app. Uh, you cannot just generate tokens on its behalf. Uh, and so what can we do in order to circumvent this thing? We can use this very clever piece of research. I'm not sure uh, how many of you are aware. If not, uh, I really recommend you, you go out and read this. Basically, um, think about what happens when you log into one Microsoft app, like uh, Teams, and then you move to another Microsoft app, like Outlook, and you don't get re-authenticated. Right? Something, something happens there. These are different apps in different domains, different tokens. If you look at the tokens, you'll see different tokens. So the way that, it work, that this works is that there's undocumented behavior on the AAD side that allows you to exchange one refresh token with one client ID and one resource permission with another refresh token with another, uh, other, another client ID and another refresh token, and, and another resource. And this works throughout the entire, the entire Microsoft suite of products. So there are, I think uh, we'll see in a moment a list, but something like 20 different uh, uh, client IDs, which you can just exchange the tokens between them uh, seemingly without, without, uh, seamlessly without the user knowing. So if you get a refresh token to one of them, you actually get all of them. This also allows you, in some cases, to buy to us things like MFA, but check out this research. It's really cool. And so this is going to help us, because if we look at those client IDs, this is the list of the client IDs that are currently public, that, we all, that we've already identified as a community. You'll find two things that are really helpful here. One is Power Apps, which is actually uh, helpful, right? This is what we need. And the other is the Microsoft Azure CLI, which is, of course, something I can very easily generate tokens for. All right? So now you can see the solution, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to authenticate to Azure CLI with permissions to do something with Azure CLI, just query the, Azure graph, the Microsoft Graph or something. And then I'm just going to exchange the token for an API Hub token. Because Power Apps can, can get uh, access to this API Hub token. And so this is exactly what, what I'm going to do, and this is how this uh, screenshot actually shows uh, how it looks like to use the tool that I'm going to drop in a second, um, which allows you to, uh, again, this is, this is, this is what, what you, uh, the permissions that you need to provide, right? You authenticate to Microsoft Azure CLI, and then you, ha you get a whole bunch of goodies from, uh, kind of, you get uh, different tokens that, in specifically here, I'm, I'm looking for the API Hub token. All right, so now that we've solved this problem, let me show you what I can do with it. Um, this entire thing is just going to be a demo of PowerPoint. PowerPoint is a tool that I'm uh, releasing today. You can find it in GitHub already. It's actually a, kind of a, the next version of uh, something I put in, uh, I, I uh, shared in, on DEF CON last year. And PowerPoint is, a, is going to allow you to do everything I, I explained so far and actually much more. Uh, so PowerPoint has different modules. Uh, the dump module, which we're going to talk about right now, um, there are also three modules I'm not going to talk about, uh, creating a backdoor, uh, which is actually a backdoor that persists through even if you delete the user, uh, phishing campaigns inside of an org, no-code malware, which is a reference to kind of uh, uh, the talk I gave at, last, at, at DEF CON last year. Um, check this out. This is a 
kind of this, people are doing really, really cool things with this uh, already. And so we're going to focus on this part. And so what I'm going to do is just run a PowerPoint dump, and I'm going to, and this is the ID for the guest tenant. Um, and then it's going to wait, uh, kind of think for a second. It's going to acquire a token, first of all, to PowerUps. And with that token to PowerUps, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to kind of device login. Of course, you can use a token that you got from somewhere else, uh, uh, whatever you'd like. Um, I'm going to authenticate. All right, I'm authenticated as, as, as the hacker user. OK. And now it's going to, uh, first of all, enumerate all of the different resources that I have access to. I showed you connections, credentials, but actually I have access to much more. We'll see that in a moment. Um, and so I started with the token to PowerUps. Uh, I, through po the token to PowerUps, I was able to identify six applications that are available for me as a guest to use, and also nine credentials. And now I'm going to exchange this token for uh, an API hub token, and I'm going to use this API hub token to actually go through each one of those credentials and dump, and dump that credential. Um, and I'm fetching some API specs for that. Uh, you'll see that in a moment. And so, and, and, and by the time this is finished, the dump is created. And now the dump is already on, on your drive. You can see uh, a few things here. So one is that these are all of the types of connections where I found that were that I found that were that were shared. And I'm actually generating a well. You'll see that in a moment. Um, there's actually the data behind those connections. So. Here's, for example, the SQL Server that we saw earlier. You can see the different tables that exist in the SQL Server. And if I uh, look into any one of them, then I see a full dump of that uh, table. Um, I, I also have a nice little GUI for you to just kind of use. And this GUI shows all of the different things that I was able to find in this tenant. You can see that there are credentials, automations, and applications. Applications, you can, you can go into those applications and see what they have. Automations, you can, uh, you can actually run those automations. Okay? You can, you can, and and then, then those automations can do a whole bunch of different things. Uh, clicking on credentials would show you the credentials we saw earlier in this talk. So these are available here. And so the first thing you can do is go to dump. You go to dump, you see, the, you see all of the tables. Here's the data for this entire uh, SQL Server uh, with the, the um, generated uh, social security numbers. Um, you can also kind of uh, uh, look at other, other queries here. The, and the other thing that's interesting here is that there's a playground where we are actually generating a Swagger UI for each one of those connections. So you can actually dynamically use these things to, to push whatever you'd like through these connections. Specifically with SQL, note SQL pass through native query. This allows you to just run whatever you'd like on the, on the server which is kind of awesome. Um, so, and you can use the Swagger API to do that. Uh, that's, that's great. Um, check out the tool. There's plenty of more, more things you can do with it. Uh, and we're going to give uh, a few demos at Arsenal that cover what I've covered today, but also other scenarios you can do with the same tool. Uh, so please check it out. All right. So in the like four minutes or three minutes I have left, OK. Um, I need to, I need to uh, give you something. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so here's what, uh, first of all, I, I'm going to say uh, this has been, like, we've strongly collaborated with Microsoft uh, throughout this entire thing. They are aware of it. They're trying to fix what they can fix. Uh, they are trying to make defaults better. Um, we have some of the mitigations that I'm just, that I'm going to share with you right now. We've actually collaborated on, on, on creating them. Um, there are no, uh, in this talk, what you've seen right now, there are no kind of vulnerabilities. Uh, there's just like, I don't know, creative reading of the docs. Um, and so I'm just going to share kind of brief, very, very briefly here. I think the number one thing that we're missing is that if we think about the shared responsibility model for, for example, serverless, we know what we need to own, right? But with low code, with the things that business users are building, we think, hey, that's, that's probably secure. The, the vendor is uh, in charge of everything. That, that's, of course, not true. I mean, you don't own the code, fine, but you own the business logic because they are using these tools to create business logic, which doesn't make sense. For example, an app that impersonates its, its, its own users. Uh, if you're interested in that part, I'm going to explain a lot, about, a lot more about it in a talk uh, tomorrow called uh, something like uh, show that business users do whatever they want. Um, what could go wrong? Um, and so. Again, 
the shared responsibility model applied, applies here as well. The platforms themselves need to own their part. And uh, if you're looking at news just last week, Tenable found uh, like a crucial multi-tenant vulnerabilities in this specific organization, in this specific uh, platform that allowed them to basically replace your code with somebody else's code and, and do whatever they like, uh, unauthenticated. Uh, but you as a customer, you also need to, sh to own your part. If you help, if you are, if you work for a large Microsoft shop or you, you help a large Microsoft shop, um, can you answer those questions? Like, what are your business users building? Who are they sharing it with? What is the data that they are actually using? Uh, I think the answer is probably no. Uh, this needs to be part of AppSec. Uh, and so we need to start carrying our own. Um, and so now, in order to protect your organization, I'm going to just send, out, send you out to, in a few different directions. All of the links are going to be there, OK? One minute? OK. So very quickly. Don't overshare credentials. <laughs> That's kind of obvious, right? This is for developers. Uh, there's also a project uh, called uh, the OWASP Low Code No Code Top 10, which would illustrate all of the different things that could go wrong when business users create applications. And this is actually speaking in a language that business users can understand. So you can just send them to those links, and they'll hopefully understand uh, what they need to do better. You can harden your environment. There's secure configuration you can, you can apply to make sure that these kind of things happen less in your environment. And again, go to the link. This is not only configurations on the AAD side. You can do some configuration on the Power App side as well. Uh, you need to do uh, AppSec. Like, AppSec needs to hold this part. There are already organizations that have created uh, low-code security standards, low-code security processes within the organization, within AppSec, scanning uh, things that business users are building, putting guardrails around it. Uh, and you should definitely hack your environment because uh, other people have, are already trying. And so please uh, use PowerPoint. Um, and with that, and I think a minute of the time, uh, thank you.